was born ready. Don't be too impressed because at 5 o'clock I have to have this shirt back or I lose my deposit. It's what? I'm a daring fella. <laughs> Now I've got two other shirts that were white that I washed this with, so I have a couple pink shirts I gave to my brother. can't wear it on the stage. Well, actually, it's an altar. Right. It was Kathy's idea. He's trying to blame it on me. I hadn't called him and said, Bob, you and I are going to I wasn't to blaming it, it on you. I was giving you credit. So, so when he said red, I said, well, I got something strong for you. that we start out by singing the bird. Yeah, I do too. That's a good yeah, way. Yeah, I think it's good. I'll sing you. Don't worry, because I'll back away. Yes, don't give me that funny look. <laughs> Save that for one of my jokes. <laughs> it's 1030. I think we should just go ahead and call No, it. no, we're not. <laughs> you gotta get us kicked out. Oh, just me, not you. Yes. Yeah, I've got yes. that. Yes, I do. 
we film that too. So you remember when we were when we were rehearsing, we kind of jumped back and forth. Yeah. I asked you what role you did and what was your name. And the whole part it was me. I did it. It was my fault. Now the good thing is that you you coordinate it better. It's just musicians and the singers. Musicians wore the plum color and singers wore the bright red. Just remind me. Because we're singing. Oh, and there it goes. I think it just needed battery. Before the first song, can I make a quick thing? <coughs> Good morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rocky Point Fellowship. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Here is our preparation for worship. Heavenly Father, we will remember that you, O Lord our God, are our rock, and the Most High God, our Redeemer. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here as we worship. Amen. Amen. Now, you probably know this song. It's Will the Circle Be Unbroken? But this is something you may not have known. It was written in 1907. The words were by Ada Habershon with the composition by Charles Gabriel. It's a song about uh, grieving a mother's death and the prayer that the relationships will live on in this world and into the next. With its rich heritage in American music, this song is a favorite from the members of the Grand Old Opry, and they sing it frequently, so you may recognize this when we do. If you don't, it's not our fault. <laughs> Sorrow when they lay her in. 
everybody now. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a pattern home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Chris, will you come on up and lead us in the prayer? You kids. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful morning. Lots of kids. I love it. Will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Who makes us holy by accepting Yahweh Jesus, and blesses us with, hear, with the mitzvah of hearing the sound of the shofar. Amen. <coughs> <laughs> Barbara has an announcement. All right, so we have a special treat for you today. We've got Brad w doing a duo of the entire set of worship songs today with Kathy. So these are these are some of your old favorites. I know you've all, many of you have been asking for us to sing more of the old favorites, and many of you have been asking to have Brad sing <laughs> more often. So this is a chance for you to enjoy that. Thank you. See, you have an announcement I forgot. Good morning, family. I just want you guys to look around and look at all these babies' faces in this place. Praise God, we got a full house this morning. So welcome, children. I am your teacher. I can't wait to get in a classroom with you where we can worship and have some good fun, okay? Um, right after this song, we'll be taking the children back. If they're 10 and under, they go with me. <coughs> Connie has... Um, done nursery for us today, so we've got a couple young ones, and then I need a volunteer vet. If you're here, will you do be my second? Okay, so we're we're handled. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have an announcement? Oh, event. You'll take the teens. Ramona's taking the teens. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. God is good, right? Okay, so update on Ari. Um, it's a praise report. Okay, through all the prayers, the church, many other churches worldwide, actually. Um, he went in on Wednesday. They said he had tumors. They said they would have to remove them, do a biopsy, and all this other stuff. But guess what? They went in there. They couldn't find no more tumors. They also um, did extensive tests. But just to be on the safe side, they did do a biopsy. So what was his response? I went through all that for nothing. I said, you know what? No, you didn't. Because in the event that there is something, whatever the biopsy shows, it's in the beginning. And it can be taken care of quickly. That's the way to look at things. Even in your worst situation, there is always that if, but with God, we know things are possible. OK. So um, <coughs> as far as the Lighthouse Cafe, OK, so I was told by somebody that Beverly will be returning for our devotional. Not really sure when, but um, you know, she is sticking with the ministry. And of course, anybody that has a ministry, you're not going to say, no, you can't come back, right? I don't know. I felt like the, the mic, yeah, yeah, the mic died or something. Anyways, so we're getting ready for our Thanksgiving feast, which will be the Tuesday prior to Thanksgiving. I believe it's the 21st, yeah. So we usually start with the devotional at 1130. Now on this particular week, Thanksgiving, usually the holidays, we extend our hours instead of till just one, we will go till two, giving people, you know, the chance to fellowship. Now, I, I say this in all earnesty, that this is open to everyone, everyone, not those just down and out, not those that need a meal, but it's a good way to get to know somebody you normally wouldn't talk to. I always say that, you know, so I hope to see more faces there because we always have plenty of food. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have an announcement? All right. Where's she going? Oh, there she is. Come on up. Yeah, you. It's your birthday. <laughs> yes. The ladies or gentlemen who are going to help with the offering, please come forward.
Thanks, Jack. <laughs> You're welcome. Sorry? Did you have one? Go ahead. Bow your hearts with me. Father in heaven, forgive us our sins that we can thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you provide for us, for your mercy and grace, your son. Father, for the opportunity to give back to you what you've given us already. Father, we do it with respect and ask that you would bless those, bless it and use it to further your kingdom. Please help us to be good stewards of what you provide. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Talk with Jesus when I get home tonight. I'm going to tell him all about my troubles, and I know we'll make them right. Then I'll ask him to forgive me for the things that I've done wrong. I'm going to have a little talk with Jesus tonight when I get home. Now this world can be a struggle just living day to day. You'll run into devil with every step you take. I've seen him face a hundred times as he tried to leave me wrong. He don't understand that I don't walk this path alone. Have a little talk with Jesus when I get home tonight. I'm gonna tell him all about my troubles and I know we'll make them right. Then I'll ask to forgive me for the things that I don't know. Have a little talk with Jesus tonight when I get home. Have a little talk with Jesus tonight when I get home. Jimmy, <laughs> you want to keep uh, Jeff's uh, sister Kathy? Okay. All right. Good job, you guys. Good morning, family. What's left of you guys? Where'd it go? <laughs> I warned them. I told them. You know, I, I think I'm, I've got a new mess. I mean, mission in my life. I got to, I'm going to start, I'm going to go on uh, off. What is that that they do for people when they need money? Go fund me. Go fund me. I need a van. <laughs> huh? I'm serious. I'll go around and get them. Wow. I'm going to have to think about that. No, seriously. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You know, our fire department that I work for has a, has a fire truck that talks, right? And when we do shop with a firefighter, they bring that truck. You know what I mean? So if we get a van, let's try to make it talk. <laughs> I've seen it in action. It really, it's amazing. So, But anyway, I want you guys to bow your hearts and heads with me. I'm going to mention some people, and then also we just want to remember Israel, and we want to pray for peace. We want, we want, you know, we want justice to be served, but we want it to be served God's way, right? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God in heaven, we thank you this morning for all the wonderful things that you have done and that you're going to do for us, Lord God. Help us today to take a deep breath, and smell the roses that you made. To think about the people in our lives that matter. To push out all the world's distractions. And to really be Christians today. Seeing the needs of others. Helping when we can. Finding ways to make the community better. 
just by smiling at others and asking them how they're doing. I say this because this world is cloudy and dark. And as I see it, Christians are the only light in this world, Lord God, and I want you to use us. But I want this church to be open and receptive to the way your Holy Spirit is moving, Lord God. Help us to focus on the things that truly matter. Agape love, faith in you, trust, hope, not all the distractions, all the things that tear us down, the wars going on in this world. We need to think about you because as I see it, you are coming back. And we need to be ready. And we need, as this church and many churches around this world filled with people just like us need to start standing up and making a difference. So my prayer is, Lord God, that being said, use us. We have family members. We have family members that are suffering and struggling right now that need strength, protection, and things that only you can provide in their time of worry and need because some of us have no idea what other people are going through. But you do, Lord God. You have the answers. The biggest problem is half the time people don't ask. Help us to share the positive things through prayer that happen, the praise reports that are going on through this world. When somebody is miraculously told they have tumors and then they go in to look for them and they can't find them because you took them already. These kind of things happen because we believe in you, Lord God. I love you with all my heart and I know this church does too. Continue to heal our family and our friends. Help us to pick up the phone or go by somebody's house and see how they're doing. We are never too busy to be used by you. Use us today and thank you so much for the joy, the peace, the love, the understanding that we get and the time we get to share together with you. I love you so much and I know this church does too and thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, for those that want to stand, stand. For those that want to sit, sit. Let's praise the Lord. Just wanted to say real quick, it's a privilege to sing for you each and every time I get an opportunity to, but it's an even bigger privilege that I get to sing with Kathy today. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy what we've been doing. The next song we're going to do is Amazing Grace. In 1773, for his sermon for the New Year's service at the Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, the minister, John Newton, first penned the famous words Amazing Grace. It was then published in 1779. Now, before becoming a minister and giving his life to our Lord, Newton was a slave trader. In other words, he later wrote down he was a wretch. He was saved by our Lord's amazing grace, and the sermon was based on 1 Chronicles 17, especially verses 16 and 17. This is our version of Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Right. 
Good job, everybody. When troubles surround us and evil comes, the body grows weak, the spirit grows numb. Things be said us. No, he doesn't forget us. He sends down his love on the wings of a dove. On the wings of a snow. Now, this is the first song that Kathy and I had done when on offertory about a year and a half ago, and it sounded so good we thought we'd try it again. There's a place near to me where I'm longing to be with my friends at the old country church. Yeah, clap it. There with mother we went. And our Sundays we spent with my friends at the old country church. Now precious years, precious years of memory. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy they, bring to me. they bring to me. How I long, How I long once, once more to be. With my friends at the old country church. Now, as a small country boy, how my heart leapt with joy when I knelt at that old country church. And the Savior above in his wondrous love saved my soul in that old country church. Precious years, Precious years of memory. 
had memories. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy they bring to me. They bring to me. How I long, how I long once more to be. We're going to get a big silver bus and hit the road. This is Old Rugged Cross. Here we go. On a hill Let's give the Lord a round of applause, amen? And let's thank our worship team, amen? Take us back to the old school, huh? Well, I'm going to take you back to the old school. <laughs> All these but goodies. We're getting a history lesson today in Psalm 78. Because if you don't know, you're going to know. Psalm 78, bow your hearts with me. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you and bless you, Lord, for your word, for your Holy Spirit, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for another day, Lord. Like Warren says, another opportunity to try and get it right. And Heavenly Father, we welcome your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to open up our hearts, to open up our minds, to receive your word, Lord. And Lord, give us a hunger to want you, to want to know you more. Give us a hunger for your word, Lord. Give us a hunger to be diligent, to stand up for our faith, Lord, so that we don't fall for anything, Lord. Help us to be founded on that rock, Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, help us, Lord, to always turn to you, Lord, when we're feeling lost. Lord, please lead us and guide us today by the power of your Holy Spirit to retain what we learn here this morning, to be able to apply it to our lives, as well as in a loving way, help others apply it to their lives. Lord, we bless you and we thank you. And we ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Yahashua HaMashiach, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we have a history lesson, which goes from the time of uh, the history lesson of Israel, from the times of Moses to David. And over and over again, Israel commits itself to God, and over and over again they fail, and God is able to deliver his people, and he is also able to deliver us in the times of our failures, and the times that we have committed our lives to him, and the times that we said, Lord, we're going to be diligent, we're going to do it this time, we're going <laughs> to hang in there, and we're going to heed your commands, and we're going to heed your instructions, and we're going to follow your will, and then we fall short. But let's be like David, a man or woman after God's own heart. What does that mean, right? What does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? Well, just like we sang earlier, we cling to that rugged cross. So in other words, we don't sit in, in the mire and wallow in self-pity. We confess what we our shortcomings. We confess where we've wronged, and we pick up that cross and start following him. And let me tell you, that cross is heavy, but he's there to help you up and help guide you along the way. He may even, he may even put some wheels on the bottom of it to help you out. <laughs> I've seen a man, he used to do that, walk through Redlands, carrying that cross with wheels. He used to cruise through the market night and through all different places carrying that cross, and he had wheels. So the Lord will give you wheels for your cross, you never know. But we need to learn because man learns, man learns nothing from history if he doesn't remember the history. You know what I mean? It's, so it's like you may have, remember growing up or maybe you yourself as a youngster hearing someone older saying, hey, you know what? You might want to do this or, or this. It's going to go this way or that way. I remember my grandpa, David Verdusco, when I was a teenager visiting him and he says, Levi, as you're growing up, do yourself a favor and don't listen to your friends. Do not listen to your friends because they will lead you astray. They will lead you in the wrong way. That was his only advice to me was don't listen to your friends. As what? Oh, listen to the word. <laughs> Yeah, listen to the word. Well, I mean, everybody gets called at a different point in their life, right? And when you do, you start to learn to trust in the Lord, trust in the word, your instructions. So that's what we are examining here today. So in verse 1, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Psalm 78, verse 1. He says, give ear, O people, to my law, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Now, this word here, law, is actually Torah in the Hebrew, which means instructions. It doesn't mean a set of rules. 
It means instructions for your people, instructions for life, instructions for daily living. So he says, give ear, O people, to my instructions and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. It says, the psalmist says, I will open my mouth in a parable and I will utter dark sayings of old. Solomon was known for sharing his riddles and collecting riddles and dark sayings and parables. Uh, Proverbs 1, 6 and 7 says it like this. Starting in verse 6, he says, To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now we see evidence of this in Jesus when he was ministering and his disciples asked him, well, why do you speak in parables, right? And in Matthew 13, he quotes some Old Testament. And it's from the scriptures of Isaiah. He says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. Chapter 13, verse 15 says, For the hearts of this people have grown dull, the ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. We have that today. A lot of people don't want to hear the truth. They want to feel good, pat on the back, you're doing a good job, keep doing good, right? But there's no accountability. And when they do hear the accountability, they don't want to take that accountability to heart. It's like, if you come to me and ask me, I will tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth. You may not like it. So next time, think about asking me. <laughs> because I will tell you the truth. You know? I, I'm not here to pat you on the back, but to give you instruction of what God says about accountability. Right? As well as us, we should be truthful. If you really love your brother and sister in the Lord, and they come to you and say, hey, you know what? Honestly, let me know what you think. Be honest with them. Right? Right? honest with them our God is honest with us and it keeps us on track when we heed those instructions amen Psalm 78 verse 3 where he says I will open my mouth in a parable I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. This is a command that we teach our children. And it's not just physical children that you bear, but you may be an uncle, you may be a grandpa, you may be an aunt, uncle, you may be a friend of someone who's younger than you, and if you have the knowledge of God, it is your command to share it with the younger generation, right? All this is here for our learning so that we may benefit from it in our walk. We have the, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 7. Anybody know the Shema? <laughs> right? We say that every Friday night. And you shall love your God. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4, says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Amen? 
Oh. Verse 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your home, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That's at all times, right? In the morning? In the afternoon? Before you go to bed? While you're sleeping? <laughs> How many of you talk in your sleep? I do. <laughs> Man. My wife tells me all the time. Talk in your sleep, right? That's the Shema. That's called homeschooling, right? We're commanded to do our own homeschooling. Yes, by law, by the law of California, we got to send our kids to school, but we're commanded by God's instructions to teach our children or those that are younger than us. If we know this, we're commanded to share it. And let me tell you something. There's a blessing in sharing this with others. Because the more you share God's word, the more you yourself are blessed and you grow. And it resonates in your heart and in your mind. You start to really be founded on that rock. The more you share it, the more you remember it. The more you share it, the more you're going to live it. The more you share it, the more you're going to shine. Because if you become known for sharing the word of God and reading from the word of God, guess what? When I'm really dealing with a situation and I'm encountering a problem, I'm going to say, you know what? This guy Jimmy over here, hey, he knows the word. Right? He'll, he'll, he'll share the word with me. What does God have to say about that? And Jimmy will let me know. Right? Or I can go to Barbara and say, hey, Barbara, I know the word. You go to church. I'm struggling. What do you think God thinks about this? You know, there is a younger generation that is seeking help. There is a younger generation that is hurting inside. There is that younger generation who needs guidance, who needs instruction, who need a hug, who need a shoulder to cry on when times get tough. Be founded in the word and share with them the word. Let them know that God loves them, right? Mentor them. Verse 7. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. How many of you know that famous proverb, Proverbs 22, 6, that says, train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You got a plaque? <laughs> well, now you got some fruit coming with you today, right, that you brought that makes that plaque true. And it's true. You train up the youngsters in the way they should go, and they'll remember that. They'll remember those instructions you give them. They're going to think back as they get older. Hey, wait a minute. I remember when so-and-so shared this with me. That's the way. That's the way. They will remember it. It may be in a long season. It may be in a short season. But in between their life and those seasons, it'll resonate. And they'll start to walk. But everybody has their own time. And when they walk. Verse 8. And may... It says, verse 7, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That's very important, right? That we teach the younger generation to put their hope in God. Because there's a lot of false hope, hopes out there in the world. A lot of people will disappoint them. A lot of jobs will disappoint you. A lot of careers will disappoint you. A lot of paths will disappoint you. A lot of organizations will disappoint you. A lot of institutions will disappoint you. But 
to hoping God will not disappoint you. Amen? Put their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Remember how God works. Verse 8. It may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit is not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. This tribe, Ephraim, was the dominant tribe in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam was the, was the founder of this northern kingdom, and they developed a false religion. How many of you know people who have gone and seek after a false religion? Amen? Are you praying for them? Amen. Ephraim was strong. They were mighty. They were physically ready, but not spiritually ready. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8 says, but reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, getting yourself spiritually ready, exercising your spiritual walk so that you are ready and you are teaching other people to get ready. We were just discussing in Bible study in the back, Christ is coming soon. And the percentage of people who are diligent are like down to, what is it, 18%, 15% in another survey who are diligent to walking with the Lord. We have proof in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 that God tells one of those churches, if not two, hey, you better get your act together or you're staying behind. When that rapture comes, you're not diligent. Guess what? You're not spiritually ready. You may be physically ready, attending church every week, attending Bible study every week, carrying your Bible all the time. But if you're not spiritually ready, you're staying. There's a spiritualness that you need to walk with. You need to stand for your faith. Amen? Verse 12. Here we get into the Exodus generation, the second generation. This is going back in time. And all those during that time, all those under the age of 20 years old did not die in that wilderness. The rest who were older than 20, died and wandered that wilderness, and that generation died off. For their unbelief and for rejecting God's commands and not keeping them. They weren't diligent. They were perfectly saved. Over 2 million people came out of Egypt and wandered the promised land, but only two people inherited that promised land, Joshua and Caleb. The people who came out of Israel, they were perfectly saved because God pardoned them. God still forgave them. They were still saved, but they didn't inherit anything. The grumbling. As we would look at it, you can be perfectly saved and you can make it to heaven and be bankrupt. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Homeless in heaven. That's a good one. Amen. Right? Man. Verse 12, marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime, he also led them with a cloud and in the night with a light of fire. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depth. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Verse 17, but 
they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. 16. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. They said, this manna isn't enough. Right? They, made, they must have made everything out of manna. Can you imagine the different meals they made out of manna? Pizza, a lot of pizza, right? Manna cakes, manna bread, <laughs> manna splits. Verse 19, yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Now they're mocking God. Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for all his people? How many of you remember when God slew that serpent, Leviathan? And we read in the couple of Psalms back, a few weeks back, when he, sled that, he slew that serpent and cast the serpent to the people in the wilderness as meat. Do you remember that? We read that? Were you not here this Sunday? <laughs> You were here? Yeah, I know. I was surprised. I was like, whoa. <laughs> God straight slew that serpent and threw him the meat. Here, there you go. You guys wanted meat? I'll give you meat. <laughs> Verse 21. Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they not believed in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna on them to eat and gave them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. In the original translation, it says they ate the food of the mighty. I mean, imagine that. You're eating the same food that the angels eat. You're missing the whole spiritual part of that, right? Because they were focusing on the physical we need to focus on the spiritual elements of God's word and apply it spiritually. The best food, right? No saturated fat, no calories, right? <laughs> no sugar, no diabetes, right? No grease, no preservatives, just manna. He sent them food to the full. And he caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like dust. Oh. Feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. So they ate and were filled, for he gave them of their own desire. Has, ever, has God ever gave you of your own desire when you had your cravings? When you had your lustful wants, gave you of your own desires. A lot of the ways that God deals with this is he lets sin deal with the sin. One of God's greatest judgments is to give us exactly what we want. Right? Amen? We crave something. We lust after something. And God says, okay, here you go. Have at it. And in the end, Lord, take it from me. Lord, please take it from me. Save me. Verse 30. They were not deprived of their craving, and while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. He struck them down with the plague. In other scriptures we read in the book of Numbers, it says they ate so much meat it came out their nostrils. That's nasty. Have you ever like been eating something and you cough or something or sneeze and it comes out your nostrils? Like soda? Yeah, like soda. Man, that burns. Verse 32, in spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in fruitility. And their years in fear. When he slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, flattered him with their mouth. And they lied to him with their tongue. 
for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his, in his, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But being full of compassion, he forgave their iniquity. Our God is a compassionate God, isn't he? He puts up with a lot of our stuff, huh? Man, he's he put up with our stuff. He, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. He remembers that we are just dust. Weak. We can be weak, very weak. That's why God is so compassionate with us. That's why he's long-suffering with us. He wants us to keep learning, and that's why he has that unconditional love for each and every one of you. And for me, yes. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) I need that. I need some unconditional love. Because if I depend on that love on people, I won't get that. I'll be cut off. In a heartbeat. <laughs> Verse 40 says, How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How many of you know that you can limit God's blessings for your life? If you want to be blessed, be obedient. You know that trip they were making from Egypt to Jerusalem was a two-week walk. And instead they spent 40 years going in circles. How many of you guys gone in circles in your life? I have. Woo, 40 wonderful years of going in circles. <laughs> right? But the Lord let me learn a lot, let me tell you. We can limit God. And we can move away from God's blessings. God is showering blessings, and our scripture tells us on the good and the evil. Right? I mean, hey, he gives the entire world rain. He gives the entire world crops. He gives the entire world good soil, if we don't damage it. Animals, everything. But you can walk away from that blessing. It could be showering blessings and you get tempted in your own lust and go, oh, wait a minute. And then, you, yeah, there's something great over here, but you're walking away from the shower of blessing over there. And this thing that you chase after falls over, disappears, disappoints you, and then you're like, oh, Lord, what? There's no more water? No. What was I thinking? Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. What are you reaping today? What kind of seeds are you planting today? What are you reaping in your life? Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We can limit God by unbelief, by our sin, by our own selfish desires. We can limit God. We can actually change God's time frame that he has for that plan in our life. 40 years. Imagine two weeks to 40 years. How much in our lives have we stopped and limited God of what he really wants to do in our lives? Because of our own selfishness? Because of our own lusts? Because of our own sins? Or because of our own belief? How about this belief? I'm not good enough to do that. But I don't have enough money. But I don't even have the right mindset. You don't understand. I'm not capable. No, 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 no. With God, all things are possible. Amen? With God, all things are possible. 
right? Don't depend on, on who you think you are. Examine God's word and know and look and see how God sees you, how you can be. The moment you accept Jesus Christ into your life, you have the creator of the entire universe, his spirit living inside of you. When Jesus Christ said, all authority and all power has been given to me, guess what? When you receive him, it now belongs to you. But you have to walk in his love. You have to walk in his ways. You have to obey. You want to be blessed? Be obedient. You will be able to speak and make mountains move. You will defy the odds that you think are against you. Amen? Your health, you can speak it and be gone. Those things that ail your health, those things that hurt your health, those things that you think you cannot overcome, you can take on God's desires, you can take on God's feelings, you can take on God's power, you can take on God's love to love your enemies. To love those who persecute you and hurt you. And make a change in your environment. All it takes is a small prayer. Amen? That's all it takes. This limitation limited <laughs> Jesus' hometown when he started his ministry. Because of their unbelief, he says, I can only do so many miracles here because of their unbelief. His own hometown was not even cheering for him. He couldn't play ball in his own hometown because of their unbelief. That's sad. I mean, if we have someone here today who makes it to the Olympics, man, we hold them high on a pedestal, don't we? Not Jesus. They, his people limited their, because of their unbelief. And we could be guilty of that. Not believing. Hindering the blessing. Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter. <laughs> Jude 1, verse 20 and 21 says it like this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, that means your faith being set apart. It's not like everybody else's. Your faith is set apart to God and to God alone, and it's genuine. Genuine faith, holy faith set apart. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourself in that love of God. Repent, confess, turn away. Amen? Verse 41 of Psalm 78. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power. How many of you guys forget you got power? Right? I do sometimes. Hey, I ain't going to lie. I get into some confrontations and I forget that I got God's power. I'm like, hold on. I got to go pray. The enemy wants to attack. I got to pray. I got to pray. Remember. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy. When he worked his signs in Egypt. And his wonders in the field of Zoan. There their rivers into blood. Turned their rivers into blood. And their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to their flocks to fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble by sending angels of destruction among them. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague. 
Egypt suffered nine plagues. And the tenth is here in verse 51. And destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first in their strength in the tents of Ham. God was not just saving Israel, but also those who would believe. When you read at the end of Exodus chapter 12, at the very end it says, And a mixed multitude followed Israel. That door to salvation is open to all and everyone who believes, who accepts, accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and puts that blood on the doorpost of their heart. Amen? Because those, not just Israel, but those were commanded if you believe in God, put that blood over your doorpost. And those angels of destruction will pass over your house. Have you put that blood on the doorpost of your heart today? Maybe we need a fresh coat. <laughs> right? How many of you need a fresh coat? I do daily. Daily, daily, daily. Amen? Amen? Our mercies, yes, refresh. How many of you ask to be refreshed daily, to be filled with the Spirit again daily? Help refresh me, Lord, this day. Give me some refreshment. I know, you know what? When I get out of work, I get on my knees and I'm like, man, I'm dragging and so much, I'm tired, and I, but I have to get on my knees and I ask, Lord, please fill me up again. I don't want to be drained. I don't like being drained. I spent 40 years being drained. <laughs> I ain't doing that no more. I have supernatural power given to me by my heavenly Father to ask in prayer for His power to refresh me again. To restrap those shoes that are nice and tight. To put on that breastplate. To guard my heart. To gird around my waist. The truth when my pants are falling down because I've been beat up. To lift up that shield of faith and plug all the holes that the enemy put in it so that it's nice and secure. That shield of faith. Put on that helmet of salvation to get rid of the stinking thinking because I've been out in the world too much. To renew my mind to be Christ-like. <clears throat> to hold in my hand. Oh, here it is. To hold in my hand that sword of the Spirit. To tell the enemy, it is written. To tell myself, hey, guess what? The promises of God, it is written. To throw that spear of prayer, the heavy artillery. Amen? We have that power. We have that power. Verse 52. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so they did not fear. How many know when you're led by the Lord, you're fearless, right? Hey, what can man do to me? Nada. We fear the one who can not only take your life but your soul. But if the one that can take your life and soul has you in the palm of his hand, and not only that, but he puts you in his Father's hand also? What do you have to fear? Amen? Our brothers and sisters, Jeff and Tess, took us to go see that movie, After Death, where those people have the near, or they died, and then they came back, and they experienced what happens. Yeah, heaven, a couple times. One thing that stuck out to me that could be pretty biblical is that a few of them actually saw Christ, and Christ is the one that told them, you're not ready yet, and sent them back. That part can be true because it is Christ and Christ alone who judges. All judgment has been given to him. So he's the one that tells you, hey, you know what? Either you're going to stay or you're gonna, you need to go back. You still got work to do. <laughs> but it was really neat seeing these experiences. A lot of them that came back, came back with a refreshed mind like, you know what? I need to get my life in order. This is what I need to share God's love. It was, a, it was, it was, it was wonderful. 
And a lot of them that didn't see Jesus, they expressed how it was when they were falling into that darkness and how they were being tormented. And they cried out to Jesus and they cried out to God and then that light opened up. Because spiritually they were still conscious. Physically they weren't. That body was dead. But your spirit is eternal. Your spirit is eternal. And those ones that came back, we have, there was one guy, he was an Asian guy, and he came back and he said he felt that darkness. He tried to commit suicide and he was falling in the dark. And as his thoughts got deeper about himself, he kept falling even faster until he cried out. He cried out. He said, God, if you're real, I don't want to keep falling. And he pulled him back up. That young man ended up healing. He, he did multiple things to himself to try and kill himself. He healed. He ended up joining the military and became a chaplain. And he encouraged others. We can get to that point where we feel that darkness. But we know that we can always cry out to the Lord to help us. To extend that hand when we feel like we're sinking. And he can bring us back up. Amen? And he does. He made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them on safely so they did not fear, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. How many of you have experienced a great sea overwhelming your enemies? I have. Thinking they can overwhelm me? No. Hey, I'm going to pray for you, brother. Yep. Right? Don't make me pray for you. <laughs> it's not good to laugh when we see our enemies overwhelmed. You know? Because the Bible teaches they can come right back on us. Amen? But we do pray that they would have that salvation, that they would not be so worldly, that God would be merciful to them and soften their heart. Amen? Verse 54, And he brought them to his holy border, the mountain which his right hand had acquired. Now we're getting into the, the time of the judges, the third generation, where they kept failing and failing, and God would send another judge, and they would fail again. This is the third generation. Verse 55, He also drove out the nations before them and allotted them an inheritance by survey. He made the tribe of Israel dwell in their tents, Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly arbored Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh the tent he had placed among them and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. You know, in the book of Judges, it's recorded that seven different nations invaded Israel and God raised up judges when the people repented and turned to him for help. God is there, man. Even in our disobedience, God is there. But all it takes is for us to cry out and repent. Verse 62, he also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke from sleep like a mighty man who shouts because of wine. And he beat back his enemies. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. He rejected that northern kingdom because of their idolatry, because of their false religion. We're not called to be a religious people. 
We're called to have a relationship, an intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior. Amen? Verse 68, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has established forever. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfold. From following the ewes that he had young, he brought him to shepherd, to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. We can learn a lot from history, right? But if we don't remember it, it will cause us not to apply it to our lives. Amen? I mean, I know all of us has a story here. I don't care how young or how old you are. You all have a story. You all have a thing that says, well, I remember I did it this way. I'm not doing that again. Or I know I <laughs> fell into this and I'm not doing that again. Or, man, I really... Yeah, don't do it like the way I did, please, you know. We all have those experiences. And so does Israel here in God's word. They have many, 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 many times where they fell. Many, many times that they cried out to God. That's the lesson here in this history lesson is that they cried out to the Lord and repented. In other words, you don't just fall and that's it. No, you get up and you try and you try and you try again. Amen? Ask the Lord for help. He will help you. He won't leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Bow your hearts with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you, Lord, that we have your word so available to us than any time in history, Lord. If there's anything we can learn is that we have access to your word in all forms, shapes, and sizes, and languages, and translations. Man, it's just so available. Help us to remember that power that lives inside of us, your power that lives inside of us, that we can call out, Lord. That we can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will be moved. That we can say to the lifestyle, be gone, I want your lifestyle, God, that we can ask for help, Lord. Help us to remember, Lord. Help us to always go to the instruction manual, Lord, your word. When we're not being instructed, that we can be instructed by the Holy Spirit through his word. He will reveal to us all things. And Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to correct us when we are wrong, to keep us on that straight and narrow path, and to always lead us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahweh HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Love one another, pray for, and forgive one another always, and do it swiftly. Don't forget to celebrate Piper's birthday in the back after service. <laughs>